We read from the Word of God this evening as we find it in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Our text is found in the 15th verse. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge thee, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake, my love, till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is gone, over and gone. The flowers appear in, on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. So far we read, may God bless that reading. We look at the 15th verse, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 6, 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our, our vines have tender grapes. We know, and this is a pretty clear reminder, that God created the earthly after the pattern of the heavenly. So that just as the tabernacle and the temple were patterned after the heavenly, so everything in the realm of creation is that way. God patterns the earthly after the heavenly. Here, we have a description of marriage with courtship preceding it. That's the big context of the book. In our text, we specifically have a picture of a husband man with his vineyards. And he's given the call or the command to exercise himself in a special way, among all the ways he's supposed to take care of his vineyard, in a special way, he's to do that, especially with those 
little foxes that can spoil or ruin the vines. These two, courtship and vineyard and a husbandman, are a picture of the relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. He is our husband. He's courting us now in anticipation to the wedding feast. And we will be experiencing the fullness of that marriage with him. We have it already. We are betrothed to him so that it is a marriage. And that will be realized in the heaven to come. But also, just as we hear Jesus in Matthew 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches, my father is the husbandman, describes and uses the same figure that's specifically used in our text. We take a look at the broader context as the setting first for the specific use of the words that we find in verse 15. When it says, take us, the foxes, then literally that those first two words, take us, are really one word in the Hebrew, and they mean take possession, seize, catch. So not take us, but more take up. Get a hold of those foxes, catch them, trap them, and especially the little foxes. The picture of the whole book is that of a relationship between the king and a poor Shulamite maiden, lowly in her status and position, but she meets the king or he meets her. She sees someone who is handsome, but she also sees someone who is very wise. And she immediately admonishes all the others to stand away. And she looks at him as a rose in the valley and a lily among thorns. Every other person that she could possibly court is a, a thorns, especially in comparison to the judgment that she's making of the king. And the king does that of her. He looks at her. He's attracted to her. She seems to be initiating it, and yet she withdraws herself because she accepts the God-ordained role that he is to take the initiative. But he sees qualities in her that what she is looking for in him is what's the wisdom of God. She's looking not for his ability to joke and his ability to make money or his handsomeness, but she's looking for wisdom. She's looking for spirituality. She's looking for someone who is capable of leading her in the right way. She sees that as wisdom. And he sees that, she looks for that as something which makes her very attractive to him. They've gone through the awkward stage that often a relationship has at its very beginning so that he looks at her from a distance. The last part of verse 9, he kind of stands behind the trees and behind the wall and tries to catch peeks at her takes a look at her from a distance. He wants to see her through the lattice. That's enough to make his heart beat fast. But now, well, there is still some of that because when she admires him as being such a wonderful man, she says of him in verse 8 that he's capable of leaping over mountains and skipping over hills. So her admiration for him and his ability is exaggerated. He leaps over mountains and over hills. 
he can do anything sort of idea. But they have a desire to get to know each other better. And they know that they can't do that at distance. And they know that they're, they need to get past that awkward stage. And so in the last part of verse 13, Arise, my fair one, come away. In the last part of verse 10, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And the idea is, let's get to a point where we're not distracted by other things, but we can communicate. We can talk. We want to get past that stage where each one is trying to demonstrate to the other how wonderful they are. I mean, the door is being held. He lets her go through the door first. He's being very generous. But now, get past that. Maybe he ought to keep doing those kinds of activities. But at the same time, he's not fake anymore. And she's not fake. And they're able to talk, really to talk. It is sad that even today, I've, seen, I've been able to have the sad experience of watching him win her. And once they're married, it all turns around, and then his true nature comes out, or hers, and that's horribly sad. The whole point of courtship is to develop communications that will continue throughout the course of the marriage. A love that develops and unfolds, however, is always going to have difficulties. And the reason is that is simple. Everybody you're going to want to court is a sinner. And you realize that truth be told, in your honesty you're going to say, and I'm a greater one. And that's a part of the communication. So there's going to be in every courtship troubles and problems. If they're big ones, then the relationship ought to end. But everyone is going to have little foxes. Little foxes that, why does he snap his gum? Or why does she do this or that, that just kind of grates. And just like this morning, it's learning how to handle, how to deal with the sins of the other, the weaknesses of the other, the irritations that we allow ourselves to be irritated by in the other. How do we deal with them? This morning, it is no problem to honor those that are doing their job well and have a personality that's attractive to us. The real test that God is giving to us is when we have to honor those who aren't doing it right. Do we have an excuse not to honor? Absolutely not. But there's the test. There's God's trial. There's our having to develop ourselves so that we can honor those who aren't doing it as they ought, but still are in a position of authority over us. Whether it's a parent, whether it's a husband, whether it's an employer. Employers you can leave. Parents and, and husbands you may not. Office bearers. How do we handle that? How do we work through that? Which is the harder, the more difficult. 
How do we deal with the little foxes? Can we work our way through them? And if we can't in the courtship, then we won't be able to in the marriage. So it's a good thing that they arise so that we learn not to ignore them, not to blindly hope that they're going to change, but rather we work our way through it by forgiving, by communicating our concerns, and see how they respond. So the purpose of the courtship is to catch the little foxes, to learn how to deal with the irritations without our blowing up, without our doing wicked or hurtful things to ourselves or to the other. Now that's the context. The specific passage deals with what little foxes do in vineyards. A husbandman, the particular name we give to one who's got a vineyard and his purpose is to grow grapes. He tends that vineyard with tremendous care. He's worked the soil. It can't be too wet and stay constantly wet. It has to be often on a hill where the possibility of the winds blowing either to rise or to fall are going to be there and in the presence of the winds to decrease the possibility of frost. He's got to know where to go to get the roots for his vines. All the vines and all the vineyards we have here in the United States originally came from Europe because grapes grow by planting roots. They want to get the best roots. They want to plant them space sufficiently so that they can come up and then branch out on the wires or the strings that they have hanging above them. They want to weed them because Matthew 13 indicates that there are thistles and there are thorns that can choke out the good seed. He needs to prune them to know which branches to prune so that as Jesus speaks of it in John 15, so that the branch can produce more and better fruit. He's got to put a wall around it so that young kids seeing the possibility of ripe grapes don't walk in there and just pluck them when they're just ready to be harvested. He's got to put a watchtower sometimes in in that vineyard. But he's got to watch out for foxes. It seemed to be a specific nature of that day that in the spring, when the vines are producing not already grapes, but the buds and the blossoms, that's the better translation than the tender grapes. The tender grapes refers to the buds and the blossoms. And then the little foxes would like to come and they would frolic in there. Sometimes they would dig and destroy the roots. Sometimes they would gnaw at the vines. But usually they would just be running and playing with each other and banging against the branches and knocking off the buds and the blossoms. The, the husbandman has to prevent those foxes, those little foxes. He's got to catch them, trap them, kill them, or send them away. They spoil. They destroy the vine. They knock off the branches or the buds. God, in his grace, takes children of Adam and he transplants us. Now, that's not a part of the figure, but the picture and the reality is he transplants us. He cuts us off from the root of Adam, and he transplants us into the root of Jesus Christ. He does that by giving to us a connection. That connection is described in the scriptures and the creeds as faith. Faith 
is that bond that unites us to the root of Jesus Christ. The husbandman watches over us. But the point and the purpose of all the of everyone that's implanted into Christ is that they produce the fruit of praise and thanks to God. The Belgic Confession. Well, let's do the baptism formula. The work of salvation is so that we produce the fruit of new obedience. That fruit of new obedience is that we cleave to the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trust Him. Love Him. That we forsake the world. Crucify the old man and old nature. And maybe this says it all and sums it up most. We walk in a new and holy life. Walk in a new and holy life. The Lord's Supper form <clears throat> puts it this way. Here's the new holy life. This is the way of new obedience. That everyone examine whether he purposes to show thankfulness. The whole last part of the catechism. Through true thankfulness to God in his whole life. To walk uprightly before him. And how do you do that? Especially in relationship to one another. That we lay aside unfakely all enmity, hatred, envy, grudges. And that we're firmly resolved to walk in true love and peace with each other. And anyone that God puts in our path. Article 4024 of the Belgian Confession. True faith is that operation of the Spirit whereby we're regenerated and made a new man, causing us to live a new life, freeing us from the bondage of sin, so that as the canons describe a saint, called into union with Jesus Christ, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and Delivered from the dominion and slavery of sin. Not completely. Not altogether. But we're delivered from its right to rule over us. So that this justifying faith delivers us from self-love and from the fear of damnation. And instead we live out of love for God. That we love Him. That's what is so evident. The fruit of a child of God is that we love God. You want a good husband? Does he love God? Not whether he loves you. Does he love God? You want a wife that's going to be a gem? Does she show she loves God? Do we deal with the little foxes, the irritations and the troubles in our life? Not by dealing with each other as much as dealing with the God who put them there. And he wants us to grow from them so that we're looking at him and realize that cross, that irritation is a gift. A gift. That he wants me to carry. Not kicking it. Not cursing it. But thanking him for it. Because it's the means and the instrument whereby he teaches me how to walk in thanks and in love to him. It is impossible that this holy faith should be unfruitful. Then it would be a vain faith. But it's a faith that worketh by love that excites us to practice those works which God has commanded in his word. He nurtures us 
through the preaching, through the sacraments, and through discipline, by showing to us His relationship to us. Our love to Him is always two. It's always second. The knowledge of His love for us. The ability to see His hand in every part of our life. That's always one. And to know what lies behind everything that He does for us. A wisdom that is absolutely unfathomable. His ways are higher. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. They may be in the sea, and they may be that his footsteps are not known, and we don't understand why, but we're not going to not trust, and we're not going to let go. We're going to cleave to him in true faith, firm hope, and an ardent love. Now, one of the reasons... is because there's blossoms and there's buds. There's tender grapes. These little girls of Dave and Gina and your children, they watch. They see what's going on. They know how mom and dad are toward each other. What do they see? How do we handle problems? Sinner living with a sinner. Kind of be. How do we handle them? Again, governed by the knowledge of his love for us that is completely unconditional. No because, except the because that's found in him. So his love is given, unasked for. We do nothing to earn it. We do nothing to keep it. And it's still always so fervent, so unwavering, no waves in his love for us. And the knowledge of that, his relationship to us, is what gives us to know how to respond. And that's how husbands need wives and wives need husbands to work together so when one doesn't see it, the other is there. It's better that two are better than one in so many different ways to help each other, to caution each other, to be able. Now here's communication. To listen. To know how to listen. To want to listen. Because the other is a sinner, but you've learned that the other is a child of God who knows his word, who's loved by him. And even, even when they say some things wrongly, God is using them to say something to us. It may prick. It may without faith and the exercise of it make us angry. But with faith and the exercise of that faith, we hear him and not them. We learn to catch the foxes, lest the tender grapes are damaged and they learn wrongly how to conduct themselves in relationships. The little foxes are all the things that the devil and the powers of darkness and my old man, our old man, uses to spoil God's vineyard 
So it's not as fruitful as it ought. Yes, it's false teachings. But it's when I walk in self-love. When my entertainment pursuits are mine and not his. It's when I give way to fightings and wars. It's a sad thing when we hear parents who lived through 1953 say they sat at the top of the steps and every Sunday night it was a good argument. And if they weren't arguing with each other, they were condemning other people for whom Christ died. Oh, and they learned those tender grapes. How not and when not to talk about the troubles. Anything that takes the attention of a child away from love for God and gratitude to Him, those are foxes. Anything that distracts them. We catch them. Elders are to be on the lookout for the false doctrine and to nurture the sheep only in the truth of the scripture that describes God's covenant and God's relationship to us. But every member of the church must cast out of their lives everything that would hinder us from true thankfulness in the whole of our life. This is the language of the canons. This is the language of the Belgian Confession. This is the language of Scripture. Those tender grapes are nurtured when they see evidenced true repentance. See, we're sinners with sinners, right? So what should be most evidenced in the life and home of a child of God is repentance. Never can there be too many sorries. Forgive me. And it's really easy standing up here to say that. And it's very, very hard to do it. What nurtures the tender grapes are when those vines see their parents fly for refuge to Christ crucified. When they see their parents mortify their flesh with the exercise of prayer and other exercises of piety. All I'm doing is quoting the Canon's Fifth Head, Article 2. When they see the parents press forward to the goal of perfection, To say that pricks, how often do I do that? How often is that evidenced in my life? How often do I demonstrate that to your children in catechism? How often do I show that to you as your pastor? That humility, that kind of flying for refuge, that Denying oneself through those spiritual exercises of prayer and other activities of piety. That pressing forward to perfection. That firm resolve to walk in true love and peace with each other. Not only in word, but in very deed one towards another. Laying aside all enmity, hatred, envy, and all bearing of grudges. Catch the foxes. 
the little foxes when they start, just when they're starting to grow and before they can really become active and destroy. Bring forth fruits of thankfulness in rich abundance. That's right homes. That's the right atmosphere of the church of Jesus Christ. This is God's word to us. The next verse was used for the wedding of Larry and Darlene many years ago. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Do you hear him say that to you? He says, you're mine. And we say, and you are ours. My God, my Father. Live that. Evidence it. May it be real. Amen. We thank thee, Father, for this word. Now may we, by thy spirit, be pricked to develop anew, no matter how long the relationship has been, a love that reflects thy love, so that we can hear thee say to us that we are thy beloved and we never grow weary. In fact, we want to hear it all the time because our sins rise up and we wonder, are we still loved? And thou dost continue to say, Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we say and express our love for one another that it may be genuine and that may be evidenced in the whole of our life. Bless our children. May they see that atmosphere and may they delight in thee. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.